Hello AP Biology students and welcome to Unit 2, Lecture Topics 4 and 5, which covers the plasma membrane and membrane permeability. <clears throat> so when looking at the plasma membrane, um, take a few minutes to review your Unit 1 notes on, on phospholipids. But uh, here we have a picture of the phospholipid, and examining the phospholipid to the right, identify the structures that you see within that phospholipid. So take a pause for a moment and try to identify parts A, B, C, and D, and then hit play again and you'll see those answers. So if we look at the uh, different components of the phospholipid here, which is the major component of any biological membrane, letter A represents that phosphate group. Um, letter B is going to be that molecule of glycerol. Remember that fat's one of the monomers that kind of come together to form the, the fat molecule itself is glycerol. Um, C would be the hydrophilic head. And D would be those hydrophobic tails. So that hydrophilic head is made up of that phosphate group and glycerol. And then ultimately, um, the hydrophobic tails there are when you have those fatty acids joining to glycerol via that ester linkage. And you can see in that one particular phospholipid, we have both a saturated fatty acid and an unsaturated fatty acid. <clears throat> so in reference to the plasma membrane, uh, answer review questions two and four, and we'll continue on here to look a little bit more at what the plasma membrane um, does as far as function. So ultimately, the plasma membrane is going to separate the internal cell environment from the external cell environment. So the internal cell environment and the ex external cell environment um, is what we refer to the external would be that extracellular matrix. The internal cell environment would be things that are found within the cytoplasm. And recall that the cytoplasm is the area between the plasma membrane and the nuclear region. Uh, the plasma membrane itself is comprised primarily of those phospholipids, and the phospholipids are amphipathic. Um, ultimately, uh, the phospholipids have that hydrophilic head and that hydrophobic tail portion, making them both um, uh, <clears throat> making them both polar in one area and nonpolar in the other. And in doing so, remember that the external and internal cell environments are, are water environments, or what we refer to as aqueous environments. So the cell membranes themselves are going to form this bilayer, or the phospholipid bilayer, in which the, the heads and the tails are going to orient themselves in a way, depending on where that aqueous or water environment is located. So the plasma membrane does have the selective, selective permeability. And when you talk about permeability, you're talking about things being able to pass through the cell membrane and the ability of membranes to regulate uh, substances that are going to either enter into the cell and or exit the cell. So when you look at it and we think the hydrophilic heads are going to be oriented towards those water or aqueous environments, and the hydrophobic tails are going to be facing inward away from any aqueous environment there. So we come up with a model to describe the plasma membrane, and that model is ultimately going to be called the fluid mosaic model. Remember that a fluid is anything that has the ability to flow. And when we think of a mosaic piece of art, mosaic pieces of art have all these little individual components that come together to create this beautiful picture, but each individual component serves its purpose in creating that image. Well, the same thing here holds true for the plasma membrane and calling it the fluid mosaic model. So it is a model to describe the structure of cell membranes or, or biological membranes. And it's a fluid in that a membrane is held together by weak hydrophobic interactions and can therefore move or shift. So when we think of these phospholipids and we think of the, the cell membranes or the membranes of cell organelles, the phospholipids there aren't static. They, they're not that, it's not that they just stay in a fixed position. These things move around each other. And ultimately, 
<clears throat> things that will affect their movement are things that, can, that uh, affect their fluidity or the ability to flow are things like temperature. So temperature affects fluidity. Also, unsaturated unsatur hydrocarbon tails help maintain fluidity, flu fluidity at room temperatures. <clears throat> what you also have is that the kink tails, remember that you get kink tails in those um, when you have carbon-carbon double bonds, so kink tails are going to prevent tight packing of, of phospholipids within the cell membrane itself. The other thing that adds into the uh, structure of the uh, cell membrane is cholesterol, and cholesterol is going to help maintain fluidity at high and uh, low temperatures. In doing such at high temperatures, uh, cholesterol will help reduce movement, but on lower temperatures, it reduces the tight packing of phospholipids with each other. So again, that mosaic model means that it's comprised of many macromolecules. It's, it has uh, the, the fats, which is the major component, but you also have proteins embedded in there. You have other types of fats that are embedded in there, and you also have uh, carbohydrates that play a role in the cell membrane as well. So let's look at the role that some of these other substances found in the plasma membrane play. So first thing there we could take a look at are membrane proteins. And there are two major categories of proteins that are in the membrane. You're gonna have those membranes that are integral proteins, and you're also gonna have membranes that are peripheral proteins. Integral proteins are the proteins that are going to be embedded into the lipid bilayer. Um, so they, those are going to span across the membrane. So here you can see some examples of integral proteins, how they actually span across an entire membrane space. Um, these are also known as transmembrane proteins. They are amphipathic in nature. The other thing would be the peripheral proteins. Um, peripheral proteins, like kind of like peripheral vision, peripheral proteins are going to be proteins that are not embedded into the lipid bilayer, but they're going to be uh, loosely bonded uh, at the surface. So here you can see some peripheral peripheral proteins and how they're they're just not spanning across the entire biological membrane there. They're just found on the outer edge, whether it would lead to the internal cell environment, the cytoplasm area, or the external cell environment, that extracellular matrix. Also, you have membrane carbohydrates. Um, these are important for cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Uh, you have glycolipids, which are carb carbohydrates or sugars that are going to be bonded to lipids themselves. And then you also have glycoproteins, and these are going to be carbohydrates that are bonded to protein-based molecules. Um, ultimately, it's the glycoproteins that are most abundant in the cell membrane over the glycolipids. But again, th they are going to help play a role with cell uh, communication there and cell recognition. So there you can see the examples. This would be the glycolipid as this, this carbohydrate chain is attached to a phospholipid. This here would be a channel protein, and there we have the carbohydrate chain attached to that, giving it a glycoprotein name. So let's take a look at the plant cell. Um, plant cells have a cell wall that covers their plasma membrane. Animal cells do not have that cell wall. Um, the extracellular structures not found in animal cells, and basically what it does for the plant, it's going to provide shape and structure. It's going to be a source of protection for plant cells, and it's going to regulate uh, water intake by the plant. The plant cell wall is composed of cellulose, that, that complex polysaccharide. That's the major component of all cell walls. Um, it's going to be thicker than the plasma membrane themselves. And because the cell wall is, is thicker than a plasma membrane, what you need are these special channels in there, and we call them plasmodesmata. Everybody say plasmodesmata. 
So the plasmodesmata are going to be hole-like structures in the cell wall that are going to be filled with cytosol and they're going to be used to connect adjacent cells. And it's ultimately going to be the, these uh, plasmodesmata that are going to allow for things to move between plant cell to plant cell. Otherwise, if you didn't have those channels, um, things, uh, things such as water, nutrients, and minerals would not be able to pass in, in and out to other cells because that cell wall is so thick and, 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 rigid, in, or, and rigid in structure. So here is uh, the FRQ. Um, take a look at the FRQ. Uh, give it some practice, letters A, B, and C, and then we will come back and, and look at this in the uh, in class. Um, this is a pretty cool FRQ because these are, are, are fish that are able to withstand uh, very cold temperatures found in the Southern Ocean around down Antarctica. They kind of have like this antifreeze in their blood. So give that a try. And then also be sure to work on the practice problems on pages 30 and 31 of your notes and also those review questions for topics four and five. So thank you again for tuning in, AP Biology students. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in class. Um, be sure to write them down so you do not forget. Um, with that being said, have a nice day.